Hello there, welcome back to Lawrence Explains Online Academic Tuition. Uh, so in the previous video, I took you guys through the entire play um, from Act 1, Scene 1, uh, right up and until the finale. So uh, hopefully that was something that was useful to you, um, gives you a really good overview of the play as a whole. Now what I'm going to do in... Uh, the next few videos is I'm going to focus in on uh, specific areas of the text. Uh, most probably I'm going to look at a number of soliloquies and that's really going to be our starting point. That's where we're going to work from. Um, so you've got the, the grand overall picture and then you've got this really fine uh, detailed knowledge as well of the text and the kind of key points in the text. Um, so another thing I would just uh, want to point out as well, um, the last few videos have taken me quite a while to prepare and more significantly to edit. Um, it's quite an arduous process really. So what I'm going to do going forward is I'm just going to shoot these videos in one take. Uh, I may even try and do some lives as well um, when I've got that up and running on YouTube. Um, so that's the plan going forward. So this may not be perhaps as perfect in its delivery as the other um, as the other videos, um, but the idea is really this is going to allow me to be more productive because it's going to save me time and it's going to be a lot more sustainable. Um, so with that, I will get going with this analysis. So this first um, soliloquy here is from Lady Macbeth. I think this is arguably the first big important soliloquy of the play. There are a few asides from Macbeth earlier on in the play, but this is um, probably the most important one early on in the play. So this is from um, Act 1, Scene 5. And let's just um, read through it first of all. So I'll read it aloud, uh, follow along. They met me in the day of success, and I have learnt by the perfect report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Whilst I stood, wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king who all hailed me Thane of Cordor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming of time with Hail King that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, and thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart, and farewell. Glamest, they, glamest thou art, and cordor uh, thou shalt be. What thou art promised, yet I do fear thy nature. is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thus have great glamis, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, and wishest, should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have crowned withal. Okay. Um, so as you can see, I am not a rather trained Shakespearean actor, um, but hopefully you, you followed along there. Let's actually begin to break down this speech here. So the first part, we've got quotation marks. And uh, it's important that we realize that this first part is Lady Macbeth reading a letter. Uh, and it's, she's reading the letter written by Macbeth himself. So actually, she's reading out Macbeth's words. It's a nice device, actually. Um, so we hear the news from Macbeth, how he delivers it to her. She reads this aloud. And 
we have you know further details uh, as an audience we already know this um, but the way Macbeth expresses it they have more in them than mortal knowledge so again we've got this concept of the the supernatural um, uh, interjecting and, and bearing upon the play I burned in a desire to question them further so his curiosity was really peaked he burned in the desire whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it <clears throat> came missives from the king so while he was just like wow this is what an uh, immense powerful experience I'm having here the missives the notices the letters from the king arrived and he was crowned uh, he was given the title Thane of Cawdor um, and obviously he uh, discusses there these weird sisters saluted me and referred me uh, to the coming of time with hail king that shall be and so he's basically saying you know the prediction came true straight away before I'd even really finished this um, most unusual supernatural experience uh, and the way he addresses Lady Macbeth, I think, is important. This is a nice quote. My dearest partner of greatness. So again, this um, this kind of fits with the idea of Lady Macbeth being a powerful character. Um, there's different discussions of gender dynamics and gender roles in Shakespeare. Uh, I, I actually think Shakespeare writes very interestingly about women. Most In most of the plays, there are women with very significant roles in the play who wield a um, significant amount of power and influence in the play and uh, in some cases Lady Macbeth being a case in point she's really one of the drivers in the play if not the driver of the action in the play uh, and Macbeth addresses her as such my dearest partner of greatness so he definitely sees her as an equal and I think that's actually an important thing to remember um, that thou mightst not lose the joys of rejoicing so basically uh, you know she he's delivering this notice to her so that she's able to uh, rejoice and enjoy what greatness is promised thee so obviously if Macbeth becomes king what does Lady Macbeth become she becomes queen lay it to thy, to thy heart and farewell okay um, so this is, uh, you know, fairly, uh, you know, this is a kind of doting husband in a way who's like very happy to, in this case, he doesn't have the option to call her or text her. So he's sending her a letter expressing his happiness, well, his, his thoughts anyway, and his excitement rather, and uh, sharing that with uh, Lady Macbeth. Okay, so the second part of this speech here, uh, we have the uh, response of Lady Macbeth. So we have um, her own thought process, her own internal um, considerations and dialogue. So let's have a look at this. Glamis thou art, and Cordor uh, thou shalt be. I think that should be thou shalt be. What thou art promised. Um, so you become... Um, Cordor and you shall be what you promise yet I do fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness so this is a absolutely classic quote here I fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness so her assessment of Macbeth uh, he is too kind too nice <laughs> the, the brutal soldier that Macbeth who we just know has unseemed um, a rival from Knave to the Chap. So this like ruthless soldier, she believes that he's still too full of the milk of human kindness. He's not actually um, cold enough to, to carry this out. So uh, her assessment is ultimately correct. Uh, she is correct about this. So that's important that we, we remember that going forward. She was correct in her assessment of her husband. Secondly, um, there's an implication here. I fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Well, 
What does she mean by that? Why why would he why would this be a problem? And and what is the nearest way? Why is being too full of the milk of human kindness a problem? There's an implication in this. And the implication is she already knows what's gonna have to transpire. She's already aware of what will have to happen. Uh, she assumes that they are going to have to commit murder. So there is an assumption here. So again, it kind of shows her thought process is just equally as swift and dark as Macbeth's and the assumption of murder and regicide. Straight away, it's not something that she needs to go over in her head of how is he going to become king. No, she knows how he's going to become king. Or not without ambition, but without the illness to attend it. So that's a lovely, a balanced phrase there. Not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. So he's got the ambition, but he doesn't have the illness. In this case, the viciousness and the ruthlessness, and the coldness that needs to go alongside ambition in her eyes to succeed. Um, so this is a great quotation. That's definitely one I would take from this. Um, again, that's her, that's her viewpoint on her husband and it is basically correct. Um, now we have all of these conditionals here. Wouldst thou, wouldst thou, wouldst thou, wouldst, wouldst, etc, etc. Um, so we've got a number here of, I would say, conditional phrases. Those are the ones I struggled with as I was reading them out. Would, would, would. And that obviously um, suggests and communicates that we're still in this phase of potentiality. We're still um, at a point where this is, this is theory at this point. Uh, it's theory, it's uh, a desire, it's not a realized fact or ambition. Ambition. And the, the multiple conditionals there, would, 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 etc., would is the conditional tense, that just emphasizes that fact. Um, and here we have the last kind of section we're entering into here. Hide thee hither that I, my, that I may pour my spirit in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have crowned with all. Okay, so hide thee hither, like come back, come home, essentially. So come back to me, your wife. Uh, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, that I may pour my spirits. So she's in, in a sense, she is invoking the supernatural, linguistically at least. Um, and the sentence as a whole means, you know, I may, you know, get into your ear, essentially manipulate you, really. That's what she's saying. So come back, allow me to manipulate you or allow me to uh, strengthen your resolve and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round so chastise um, meaning sort of in a way kind of means harass or um, attack with the valor of her tongue so by her own speech anything that impedes him anything that gets him um, uh, gets in the way of him achieving the golden round, so the crown. Um, so basically she's saying, you know, come back and let me, you know, kind of get uh, get your ear, let me, let me uh, speak to you um, and, and, and uh, whisper my thoughts into your ear and, and, and give you strength, but in a sense also manipulate you as well. Uh, which fate and metaphysical, metaphysical aid. Metaphysical just means like of um, uh, the gods or something supernatural, something meta, which is means above, above the physical. Um, so we've got fate and the metaphysical um, seem to have crowned Macbeth. 
So this is a really key quotation here. There's, there's an aspect of, I think, sensuality to this as well. The idea of him, her kind of pouring her spirit into his ear, chastising him with the valor of, his, of her tongue. So there's, there's a sensuality to that as well. Um, but the overall meaning is that she knows she needs him to come back into her fold, into her ambit of influence, and um, she needs to be able to uh, speak to him and, and influence him and basically manipulate him. So, and so she she plans this out and she wills it hide thee hither. And this is exactly what transpires. So we see from the outset, you know, Lady Macbeth is has a very high level of social psychological intelligence and. Um, she's also extremely ruthless and extremely ambitious herself and frankly quite happy to use her husband as a tool towards her own um, desires and it, it kind of goes both ways as well because he also has similar desires um, but she knows she needs to push him even further um, so uh, this is the, the first soliloquy it reveals quite a bit about Lady Macbeth's character some great quotations there and obviously we learn her kind of intellect and her social intelligence are pretty formidable. And she has really the perfect assessment of the situation, which as time goes on, we see she was in fact correct in her assessment. And she was also right about what she would do and how that would, would play out as well. So we see her intellect and her foresight early on in the play. Uh, so. I will leave this uh, video there and shortly I'm going to come back and we're going to take a look at the, the next, um, so what's going on here, yeah, so shortly we're going to come back and take a look at the, the next soliloquy which follows up later in this scene, Act 1, Scene 5, so I'll be back and I'll get that one up and running shortly, so uh, I will leave you with that.